Hi, my name is Ellen Millinder. Welcome to Faculty Office Hours. I am chair of the Department of Classics and I teach Greek and Latin at all levels. I'm the ancient historian at Reed and I also teach in Humanities 110. Hi, I'm John Rourke. I teach in the Economics Department. Um, I have been here now 10 years, I think. Um, and I teach primarily the theory classes in Econ, but I also do um, game theory and I'm a tax economist is what I study. Classics at Reed has two tracks. So the traditional track is called Greek and Latin. And that, the way that track works uh, for the major, you take three years of one language, ancient Greek or ancient Latin, uh, Latin and then you should take one year of the other language. Usually our students do more than that. Uh, you also have to do two other courses in the department um, with an uh, archaeology or ancient history. And in addition to that, we have a junior qual. Uh, we can talk about that at some point if you have questions about the qual. Every department has what we call a qualifying exam. Uh, in classics, it is literally writing a long research paper, about 20 pages in length for a course in your junior year, which we believe then sets you up in, uh, for the senior thesis. And then a number of years ago, we hired an archaeologist. We're very happy about that. And we started a new line in classics, which is called HOM, not HAM. I always joke, it's HOM. It's the History and Archaeology of the Ancient Mediterranean. And that involves students taking at least two years in one language in classics and then taking an array of courses in classics and in allied departments. So archaeology, history, allied departments, art history, anthropology, um, religion, um, history, etc. And again, doing a junior qual and then senior thesis. And then senior thesis, just quickly, classics is an inherently interdisciplinary major. We have seniors do all manner of topics, uh, ancient medicine, history, archaeology, theater, philosophy, um, lit, lang, you name it. At Reed, we do something slightly different, which is we do an intro course, R201, which is a combination course of intermediate level micro and intro macro. Why we do that um, is twofold. One, we find y'all get bored real quickly um, if we end up doing too much intro econ. Second, it allows us to kind of jump into the fun stuff. By having this one intro course, it allows you to jump into basically everything else. The way the econ major is designed is it's incredibly flat. So you take this intro 201 course, and then everything else is available to you having taken that course in our major. In econ, our intro is a 200 level. So even though you're a first year, we don't care, jump right in, let's go. And then you are able to, if you were to take econ in your, you know, in the fall, you're able to take a 300 level junior senior course in your second semester of your first year which is pretty powerful. From a thesis standpoint, econ, this is always one that always bothers people, like what can you do? And just kind of like Ellen said, all sorts of things. Um, we do all sorts of weird things too. Um, I'm gonna give you kind of what my students are doing this year. So I've got one student looking at um, gentrification in Portland and trying to study that. I've got one person looking at the role of taxation and crime rates, which is kind of an interesting sort of thing. I've got one looking at tuition reciprocity agreements between states and whether or not that causes people to go from Oregon to Washington to go to college, something like along those lines. And then the more interesting one, which gets people kind of psyched and kind of lets you know that like you can really think crazy, is I have somebody basically who spent the last semester creating a virtual economy based on loot boxes for you video gamer types. Within econ, we have two tracks. I didn't mention this either earlier. One is kind of the straightforward kind of, I'm just doing econ and just call me an econ major. Um, we have this thing called quantitative econ, which is more for our math folks who like to geek out on the math. Generally, that one tends to be more for people who are thinking grad school. One of the things that I think is great about classics, and I think gives classics, if I have to say this, I have to, I have to say this for my field, an edge is that we're interdisciplinary. So you literally gain so many different perspectives because you're looking at you're looking at a, a world from the perspective of what? The language these people speak, the literature that they wrote, the philosophy, the way that, they're, the way that their brains work philosophically, historically. We look at material remains. So I think classics creates very nimble thinkers. The best thing about teaching at Reed, and I can say this, I've taught at three different institutions. I'm not naming the other two, okay? Reed students are an absolute joy to teach. 
because the students I've had it read almost routinely are here because they really have a love of learning, seriously. So students are really academically engaged, remarkably supportive of each other. And what really amazes me, it's not the capacity to do a lot of work. That's not to me the issue. It's the engagement that students have. And if I can just give one example, and John will realize what a crazy department I have. So um, the first year, a long time ago now, when I was first chair of my department, and I was so proud of myself for putting our schedule together. And like an idiot, I double scheduled myself. So I literally scheduled two of my classes where there was a 10 minute overlap. And uh, I'm embarrassed, so what did I do? I had to start my earlier class at 8.30 in the morning. And I know you're all going, oh my God, but 8.30 in the morning at college, is like death, okay? And this is an advanced Greek class on the historian named Herodotus. And I thought this is gonna be a nightmare. And honest to God, it was probably one of the best classes I've ever taught. Just to give you, I'm sitting in my office and my the, the classroom was right down the hall and I hear three of the students running down the hall going, that was the coolest article I have ever read. This is at 8.20 in the morning, okay? There's no way I would have ever experienced that anywhere, anywhere. And that's why at Reed, even teaching remotely, I am still absolutely loving it because I love my students. And I guess for me, what I would say is, is Reed allows me to um, do two things. It allows me to geek out and be okay and that it's cool to be okay interested in my academics. Some other places you're going to have to hide that because you have to hide it behind the baseball team or other sorts of things or whatever. Um, and I feel I can just be out front and dorky at times when I want. And so I'm a tax economist. I can dork out about changes to the tax code. Um, when we did the tax, you know, the tax reform last year, like I was teaching, like that was fun. I could teach it. But the other thing is that the students let me experiment with things in the classroom and I can try all sorts of weird things and we'll see if it works or not. So I teach game theory. Game theory is all about strategy. So I took a chance the first year I taught this course, and I was like, I'm going to board game in the middle of my class. So I just bring board gaming in, and so now it's morphed into this thing where we board game once a week. And the idea is that when you play board games, you're doing strategy against other players. It's very strategic in that sort of way, and it's a very sort of way of taking the mathematical sort of stuff that we're doing in class and putting it into something practical and tangible and kind of ways that we can do this. And what I do over time is I make the games more and more complicated. So you start from like a, 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 a tic-tac-toe sort of level and we move up into something a lot more complicated. And by the end, the students are able to try to figure out two steps ahead, three steps ahead, four steps ahead. And they're doing it all in the gaming sort of thing. And then when we talk about how you do it in the modeling, they're like, oh, this is like this, 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 this. And it kind of made everything come together. I would never in a million years take that chance anywhere else because it, it is really a risk. If it blows up in my face, it's like, well, maybe it will. But it really didn't. Um, but I also knew that if it did blow up in my face, the students, A, would tell me that it blew up in my face. B, we'd have a conversation of what were you trying to accomplish with this? And C, why don't you try this? And let's see if this works. And occasionally you're going to be like, I really want to learn X. And I know nothing about X. All right, let's figure it out. And so we tear up the syllabus and we decide we're going to figure out X because half the students want to do X. Like right now, I'm going to have to figure out how to talk about COVID and how to teach about that. And what does it mean to have a depression in the middle of like, what does this all mean? Like, like, like the econ's changing right in front of me. Mm -hmm. So I have to adjust because the students want to do that. And I don't know exactly how to do that yet. And the students are okay with that as long as we're kind of figuring it out together.